KGRA Radio and Pop Culture Mindfield presents Dangerous Military Nerds. Dangerous Military Nerds. They're just like regular nerds, only dangerous. And now, your hosts, Don Ecker and Gary Cassell. I love the way uh, uh, Max says your name, Ecker. <laughs> By the um, way, Gary, I didn't shave today. Do you, uh, me do you find either. that objectionable? No, I like it, man. I okay. like my men hairy. Uh, Good. <laughs> hey, um, our guest today is uh, in the back, and I'm going to bring him forward right now, is none other than uh, film and TV uh, director, author, screenwriter, and probably one of my dearest friends on the planet, Josh Becker. Um, been friends with this guy for a long time, man. Uh, and once again, I have nothing but uh, <laughs> thanks to Bruce Campbell for introducing me to you. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Josh, welcome to Dangerous Military Nerds, a show Thank dedicated to you. talking about dangerous military nerds, of which, uh-huh. you know, your script is really kind of one that I wanted to go into today because you did a lot of research for this uh, script. It's still not produced yet, but I predict no. it's either going to be a film one day or a graphic novel, which I'll be involved with. And uh, it's called the battle of Bella Wood about uh, the U S Marine Corps first fight in Uh, world devil dogs, the devil dogs, the Huns gave them that name. They did. Teufel Hunden. Yep. They were terrified of the Marines. (laughs) And I told you my own personal story of what happened there at Bella Wood with my dad, my grandfather, my dad, uh, because he was the army unit that was pushed forward when the Marines needed to come back for some R and R. And he said, they went walking by them in columns, single columns. And he looked over and every single one of the Marine was coated with mustard dirt. And the lenses were popped out of their masks, yeah. making the mask completely useless against mustard well, gas. <laughs> the Americans didn't even issue masks. The masks were French or British. And yes, that's neither, true. And neither one worked well. No, back then they didn't have that shit down yet. But uh, um, and what had happened was there was a buildup for uh, that first battle there at Bella Wood. And first the army had shown up there, but they didn't want the army to lead the way. The army instead was uh, manning a lot of the French artillery Mm -hmm. in, in positions, whereas and that's how my grandfather ended up in what's referred to as bastard brigade. He was actually artillery, but he ended up a machine gunner. With some, I'm sure you, different. you you guys are aware of the controversy <clears throat> that took place during that war with uh, the American military's use of the Winchester 1897 pump shotgun. Are you familiar with that? I am not familiar with that. What controversy? Real simple. The Krauts decided that shotgun was too effective. We're talking now primarily trench warfare, right? Right. They were unhappy because when somebody would use the shotgun, there would be another dead crowd. Well, they... (laughs) Imagine that. They actually filed an international protest. Now, these were the same sons of bitches that came out with the flamethrower mustard gas, all those other horrible weapons of war, but they got upset over the shotgun. So they said, if we capture any American with a shotgun, we're going to execute them dead on the spot. And the American response was, go ahead, because we've got a lot of your guys we can take care of too. And ah. suddenly that went away. <laughs> now, back in those it. days, we knew how to win a goddamn war. Um, it's true. But everybody it. used mustard gas, both sides. Well, they didn't before the Germans started it. Yeah. Uh, everybody used mustard gas. It's, I think it's a British development. I would be surprised as the Lamy. Uh, that it was in use for both sides. So nobody gets a clean bill of health. Maybe it was phosgene gas that they came out with. But at any rate, yeah. 
It was yeah, nasty. It, it was a nasty, nasty. It was so, you know, it was like exterminating insects. I mean, it was so nasty that everybody agreed to stop doing that, at least till Saddam Hussein decided yeah. to do it on his right. But And I got to uh, tell you, you know, um, that is part of what killed my grandfather was the scarring from mustard gas mixed with COPD from smoking. And uh -huh. killed him in 68. Um, but I, I do want to go back because Josh Becker, um, Josh, you, you cut your teeth working in, you were the first one from Detroit to go to Hollywood before any of the other guys. Uh, indeed, that's true. And, uh, and I got to I do would... the cover to your book, leaving Hollywood because you got go sick of Hollywood. going Hollywood or going Hollywood. Right. Yeah. It's good. The guy that did the cover can't remember the title and that, you, well, you never can. I'm good at the artwork. I'm not good at the titles. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did the title too. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's right. I did. Oh crap. That's right. <laughs> no, no, Gary, I, I have to give you a credit. You always screw it up. I always screw it up. It's consistent. <laughs> you are leaving. I think it's le you're thinking leaving Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Yeah. All Hollywood, I know is you, you, you hit a point and it, it, you know, where you just kind of got fed up with things. And you decided to go up North. Uh, <laughs> after you, Afterward, yeah, uh -huh. and, yeah. Uh, I moved to Oregon, yeah, for a year up up the street from Bruce Campbell, and uh, that was the middle of nowhere, and it was an overreaction. So I moved back home to Detroit, which is not too big and not too small. It's just right. And of course, from Detroit came um, Josh. He was the first one to go to Hollywood. You were the first to go. Then Bruce, and then. Uh, Sam and then uh, and Rob. I think Rob and Sam both went out at the same time, right? Rob well, they came out as they all three came out at the same time. I picked okay. them up at the airport. Uh, that was eighty one, and they had made Evil Dead, and they had a meeting at Twentieth Century Fox to show Evil Dead, and they were you know giddy out of their minds. Oh yeah, of course. Twentieth um, um, didn't pick it up, but you know that's how you start. It, and then afterward, Ted eventually followed suit too. Yeah, where did Ted, they get that name though? The Detroit Mafia. Where did that come from? Uh, people, because there was such a bunch of us there. Uh, that's what they started calling us. I don't know. Um, I mean, because there were, and there's more than just what you mentioned. I mean, John Cameron is part of the group, and John Cameron produced all of Joel and Ethan Cohn's movies. And produced the TV show Fargo. He was right. part of our group. And there was Mike Ditz, who's a still photographer. It was a bigger group. Anyway, I'm not sure who started calling us that, but the that was going. interesting. I find because <laughs> I don't I hardly ever talk to you about all that stuff. And it's like I've never asked that. I've always been curious where that came well, from. And I don't know where it came from, so sorry. Oh, that's okay, man. I'm not disappointed. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> but Josh, um, uh, I met you because you were doing a little movie called uh, Blood Money that eventually became Running Time. I did the official artwork for you. It's my first Hollywood gig <laughs> doing artwork yep. and drawing uh, Bruce Campbell's mug, which was fun. I like drawing uh -huh. that chin. He's got a big chin. Can't miss it. He does. Uh, you know, his original title was... Uh, not if chins could kill for his book. It was leading with my chin. And I think that's a much better time. I actually do too. <laughs> leading. I know. Um, I, and also I, you have, and I still use it every once in a while, uh, have one of the best uh, quotes on my website for my artwork that says, Gary sucks less than any other artist I've ever worked <laughs> with. Josh Becker. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, <laughs> that won't get me any jobs, but I fucking love that quote. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but um, let's get into um, Bella Wood. When did well, you get inspired okay, to write so, that? Uh, okay, you going to say something. Well, it was reading about it, um, and I began to read. I said, well, that's it's the first battle. Let's back up. What was the Battle of Bella Wood, you might ask? <laughs> It 
was indeed the first battle the Americans fought in. On, and it was on June 6, 1918. And that was certainly in Dwight Eisenhower's mind when he called, said go for D-Day on June 6, 1944. That was Bellow Wood Day. So, all right. Very quickly. We didn't get into the war until 1917. The war started in 1914, and we were isolationists, and we stayed out of it. And meanwhile, as the, the war raged in Europe between Germany and France and Britain and Belgium on one side and Russia on the other, Russia had a revolution. And... The people took over, they got rid of the Tsar and his whole family, and they went, you know what, we're not fighting this war anymore. It's the Tsar's war, and we're not fighting it. And suddenly the Germans were able to take all of their troops, 34 divisions, and move them from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. They now outnumbered the Allies, <clears throat> and started to kick ass like nobody could believe. And they made the, the, the trenches, the battle lines, had not moved a mile or two east or west in three years. The Germans made 70 miles toward Paris in a week and began to bombard Paris with their big Bertha guns. Now, meanwhile, the Americans had been coming to France since April of 17, and there was an argument between the French military and the American military as to how to use the American troops. And the French wanted to fill the holes in their line with the Americans. Blackjack Pershing, our general, went no chance. And people don't realize this, but the Americans did not join the Allies. We were the American Expeditionary Force. Yep. We were separate from them. And Black Jack Pershing said, <clears throat> we go, uh, we fight our own battles. <clears throat> and General Ferdinand Foch of France went, oh, oh, no, I cannot live with that. <laughs> Until they, this happened when the Russians gave up. The Germans attacked, made 70 miles toward Paris, and began to bombard Paris with big Bertha guns. Ferdinand Foch quickly changed his mind and went, save us. You can do anything you want. Keep all your men together. And he went, fine, good. I'm sending the Marines in. And you, as you say, the Americans were already manning guns and things. But I'm sending our first force in, which is 28,000 American Marines who came up against 40,000 Germans. And this battle was fought in a one-mile square hunting preserve. 30 days of hand-to-hand -hand combat and mustard gas. And, it, and uh, guess what? That was as far west as the Germans ever made it in World War I. From the moment the Americans started to fight, the Germans got pushed east. And it took, people don't quite realize, I think, once the Americans came into that war on June 6th, that war was over by November. We kicked ass so bad. <laughs> Nobody, the Germans had never seen anything like it. And... Uh, it was the biggest battle in history, the uh, Battle of the Argonne. And it went. It had a thousand-mile battlefront from the Baltic to the Mediterranean. The biggest battle in human history. So, but this, this one is battle... This is what I about you, Josh, because you and I have had like four to six-hour-long conversations where it's a lot of it's about either film history or military history, and I love that. That you were so passionate about learning this stuff and that you wanted to write a screenplay about this battle. And it's a battle my grandfather took part in. Uh, Amazing. 
Yeah. Because, I mean, you're uh, still dealing with 28,000 Americans, not that many Americans fought in that No, I battle. mean, it's pretty much almost all of the Marines were sent there. <laughs> it's like, At that point, There's a few of the proud <clears throat> Marines for a reason. Um, but, Who uh, were relieved by the uh, uh, Army? At a point, yep, and then Army. the Marines that was went back in. My grandfather's group, they were the ones who moved up and held the position while the Marines went back. And his right. description still sticks with me to this day of them punching out the glass of their uh, masks just so they could see to aim. Because yep. there was so much mustard on them. <clears throat> but uh, it's an amazing uh, uh, story. But you, you also don't just talk about that. You also talk about one of the most celebrated Marines in the history of the Marine Corps which is, of course, Dan Daly. Uh, still to this date, the highest decorated Marine, as I recall, right, John? Enlisted. He, two, he was most, two Medal he, of Honors. Yeah. Uh, yes, he's the most decorated enlisted Marine. Chesty Puller is the Chesty. most decorated officer. Officer. And one thing I really like about him is uh, anybody that knows the history of Dan Daly knows the history of the Boxer Rebellion. And what he did there. And I like that you, that's the, the Dan Daly you write about. It's a yes. guy that's already killed a lot of fucking people. Well, when he was 19 years old, he was stationed in Peking during the Boxer Rebellion. And the Imperial and, City. Yep. And and, the Empire. Yeah. All the ambassadors were within the walled city. And thousands, tens of thousands of Boxer rebels were attacking and <clears throat> were trying to set fire to the wooden wall. And 19-year-old Dan Daly stayed up at the top of the wall with a, a I think it was a Springfield carbine Springfield rifle. Yep. and shot boxer rebels for 24 hours. Nobody knows how many of them he killed. Mountains. He kept them away from that wall 19 years old, got his first Medal of Honor. Got his second one in Haiti in 1917 during the Banana Wars. Right. And then went directly from there to World War I. So he had two Medals of Honor going into the Battle of Bellow Wood. He didn't get another one. I don't think they've given anyone three. Um, <clears throat> but he was the most heroic character in his line has been reused in so many movies. Starship um, Troopers, everything. Yes, star exactly. Starship Troopers, where they're pinned down by machine gun fire, and he stands up and says, do you guys want to live forever? Come on, attack! And they took the very bottom edge of Bellow Wood and then 30 days of hand-to-hand -hand combat to take the whole thing. But uh, the man had balls of steel. And yeah. Now, who was it? Was it him or who was it that said, uh, retreat, we just got here? That was Chesty Buller. That was Chesty. <laughs> and Chesty Buller. Badass Chesty Buller. Oh, he was just bad. Uh, he said they told him at one point, Chesty, uh, we're surrounded. And he went, good. Now we can fire in any direction. <laughs> <laughs> Chesty was a tough son of a gun. But yeah, Dan Daly was really, you know, and he's from, from New York, and he wasn't very tall, and uh, the guy was just pure guts. And he never wanted to, got to Sergeant Gunnery Sergeant, and like, no, I'm never taking another promotion. You know, I hate officers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you got to love it. Now, the one thing I, I like is, because uh, when I read your script the first time, I couldn't help but see James Cagney. Well, you're Cagney. an artist. You do that. Yeah, I have a visual image of James Cagney as Dan Daly in, in, when I read your script, and I love that script. I still do. I, still I, I saw, it. at that time, when I wrote it in the late 90s, uh, I saw Harvey Keitel. Definitely Keitel when he was younger, he, yeah. He, you know, when he was the right age. He's from New York. He's got the. He's tough. He's not that tall. He seemed like, and he was a badass marine in real life too. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, he's who I had in mind. Right, uh, and it's a great script. Um, it's going to be available. I'm going to go ahead and share 
uh, this during the show, the link to your script page, which I have to get If anyone Dan has like $20 million, could you please contact me? <laughs> okay. um, not on not on this show josh no <laughs> not on this show and, <laughs> and if it's yet. not 20 i i really can't do it <laughs> um that's still i consider that still an independent uh budget 20 million today well, 20 million is the uh cutoff in the uh writers guild directors guild of that anything below 20 is low budget i mean and, uh, i find that highly amusing it is <laughs> because you can get a lot done with 20 million dollars shit really i mean i made running time with Sci-fi. ninety thousand. yeah and you look at uh, the budget you got like you did um harpies and that was what 2.5 million total budget i didn't have 2.5 i had like 1.5 1.5 you know, uh, it came up because it was like 1.5 American, so we got, <laughs> you know, extra money because we shot in Bulgaria with the in currency exchange. Right, exactly. So I'm going to promote, if you guys uh, would like to um, start reading some of his scripts, you can go to <laughs> BeckerFilms.com, and I'm going to put it right now in the chat, and I'm only going to, this is going out to Pop Culture Minefield channel. Uh, this is Becker Films screenplay page that Danny has set up. Um, and there you go. So if you go to that page, you'll start seeing scripts be populating in a PDF format to uh, document format, you know, Microsoft uh, Windows Doc. And uh, you'll see them start populating on there as Danny adds them. And Bella Wood should be in there. Because eventually, if you do shoot a film, you'll probably end up rewriting it for a shooting script because it's not a shooting well, script look. right now. No, it's not. But here, let's, let me share some other interesting facts about Bella Wood. So okay. um, we Americans had no motorized divisions. We had no trucks. They hadn't invented Jeeps yet. And so the French had to transport our men to the battle lines because we our base was in Chaumont, which is 30 miles south of Paris. And uh, uh, the Battle of Bella Wood is about 35 or 40 miles east of Paris. So the French soldiers that took the Americans to the battle lines were Vietnamese because they were French Indo-Chinese. So the Vietnamese were part of this. And when the Americans got there, the only troops that had uh, uh, allied troops that had remained behind as 40,000 Germans had come up were the Senegalese, which was another French colony in Africa. And these were magnificent black men in white uniforms. Mm. Uh, and they, nothing, they were the only ones, every other ally had split except for these guys, and they were known as the greatest looters of the war. And each of these guys had, like, piles of bird cages and rocking chairs, and and but they held their positions. Right. And, and so, anyway, it's just how we don't, I don't usually, you know, that if France goes to war, so do all of the, you know, territories. The French, that they, yeah, the French colonies and such, yeah. So suddenly Senegalese are in the war and Vietnamese are in the war. And uh, anyway, I find that very interesting. So It is. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, there. <laughs> well, there you have it. Um, Don, you got any questions about it? Uh, you want to talk about anything with dealing with Bella Wood? Because I'm fascinated with that battle. Well, my, my grandmother's brother, my great uncle George, uh, was over there, was gassed, and uh, that ultimately ended up killing him in the late 60s, the early 70s. But he was Army, and I'm not sure exactly where he was stationed at. It very well may have been, I'm sure, during the Battle of the Argonne. But, uh, well, the no, yeah, that was huge. Was, that, was a, uh, that was a horrible meat grinder. And uh, anybody that uh, 
that knew anybody that served during that time will attest to that. Now, Josh, one thing that my grandfather, my mother's father, was a vet of the First World War, later served in the Second World War. He was a two-war vet. But uh, when I was a little kid, of course, I was fascinated by all the history that that represented. And he told me something one time that uh, I never really forgot. And basically, when I was a little kid, talking about World War I, it might as well have been the American Revolution, as far as I was concerned. Okay, yeah. that was so far outside of my ken. Uh, you know, it was like, oh, wow, you know, I could go to school and, and read a history book about it. But he told me that there were so many revolutions in technology at that time. And what he told me was one thing that I never forgot, that there had been radio-controlled unmanned aircraft that I believe the Germans were using, actually aircraft that could be flown from the ground. Did you ever come across anything like that? No, not in World yeah. War I. I yeah. mean, keep in mind, and this is a, a I think just an, one of the things that I find very interesting about history is context. And if you consider that the Wright brothers had not, did not invent the airplane until 1907, and that by 1914, all of these countries had air forces. Well, they did their first flight in December of 1903. I'm saying, but they didn't go into production. Ah, you okay. couldn't buy an airplane. You couldn't, you had to, the only airplane you could buy was a right flyer from them, and they didn't go on sale until 07. And in seven years, every country had an air force. I mean, you know, and as you well know, they like, at first their machine guns were shooting off their own propellers and they had to figure yeah. out. How to... <laughs> they had to figure out well, the they actually, yet. <laughs> they, they actually started air fighting with pistols. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and rocks. Um, <laughs> but I'm just saying, if you consider how short of a period that was between having no airplanes and suddenly having air forces that are fighting each other, um, it's kind of amazing. So I don't know about radio controlled anything. That's pretty advanced for that time. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, where you started here with the the weaponry because World War One was the first modern war, yeah. and the weaponry was so much more advanced than, say, the Civil War. I mean, it was I mean, the first use of the uh, tank um, in World War One. Just uh, everything kind George of got Patton, its start. Lieutenant George Patton. Lieutenant George uh, Patton. Let's not forget submarines. Oh, um, God, yes. Yeah. U-boats. U-boats. I got to tell my story with my grandfather because, like I said, he was uh, a cannoneer. He was trained uh, on, on art in artillery. And when he, they were shipping over in 17, um, <clears throat> the ships they were moving over on didn't have their own guns. So the army set up their cannon on the decks and they thought they saw a submarine on their way over to France. And they called out and they turned all of the cannon in that direction and fired at what looked like a submarine. And when they hit it, they realized it was a whale. They blew it apart and then they went over by it and collected it to eat. You know, it's don't waste meat. It's a sad story. It's sad, but at the same time, it did feed him good food. And here's, uh, a, here's another uh, just get difference between Civil War and First World War. Uh, <clears throat> Artillery Captain Harry S. Truman fired more shells in one day at the Battle of Meuse Argonne then were fired in the entire civil war by both sides in one day. So That's amazing. anyway, 
you had to have good earplugs there. But it was, you know, suddenly you had machine guns. Machine guns changed everything. An area that had to be held by 20 guys could now be held by one guy. Yep. You know. my The way they were set up, like my grandfather in the trench, he had a the water-cooled Hotchkiss machine gun. That's what he manned. And yes. uh, in his bastard brigade, but the, they had no turn radius. What they would do is they would aim them and they would have two of them at different points crossing their fire. And, um, and they would just aim the Hotchkiss. And the big thing, like whenever they had to retreat because the Germans were advancing, they had to back out. You couldn't pick up the whole machine gun. So what they would do is he would remove the, the firing mechanism and carry it with him. Right, because you had a uh, radiator connected to it. That's right. So he couldn't grab it, you know, so he had to take this one part and run with it until he um, could come back and take that trench back. The main, Trench warfare was insane. But ba Bella Wood has no trenches, interestingly. No. That's just where they met. Um, the main machine gun used by the Germans was the Maxim gun. Mm -hmm. And Hiram Maxim was American. And he was manufacturing machine guns for the Germans in during America. the war in America <laughs> and shipping them to Germany. How he never got called on that, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I mean, they began to manufacture them there with his design, but uh, he never stopped doing business with them. Well, he that, was, that, was a, that was a big joke before the war because uh, Maxim was wanting to get into the manufacturing, gun manufacturing business, and somebody came to him and said, hey, you want to make a million bucks? The best way to do it is to invent something for those crazy Europeans because all they want to do is kill each other. <laughs> yeah. The faster, the How can they the do better. it quickly? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then the other one that I love that I think I put really good use to in when they're pinned down at the beginning, and they're, uh, Dan Daly's got his Springfield, and he fires all of his ammunition, and he grabs another weapon, and he fires all of his ammunition, and then he grabs the first handheld automatic weapon in the war, which was French, and it was called the Shaw Shot, and Americans called them Chat Chat Guns, and they were so badly made that... When he fires off an entire clip, the whole gun falls to pieces. So, <laughs> well, they they didn't use standard manufacturing on those guns. You could have two shell shells and take them apart, try to use the parts mismatch, and they wouldn't fit. No, it French, was such a piece of junk. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if you don't understand what he just said, let me explain it again. The same gun, take parts from one to try to put in the other, and they wouldn't fucking fit. <laughs> Whereas, so once again, made. just the assembly line, which is credited to Henry Ford, in fact, is a hundred years older than that. And you could probably comment on this of was conceived to manufacture the weapon for the English army, which was called the Brown Betty. And it was a rifle that was in use longer than any other weapon for a hundred years. And they manufactured them on an assembly line. So exactly like what you said of if a, they fell apart, you could take the parts from another one and they would fit. So... And that yeah. was where Henry, Henry Ford got the assembly line idea. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. Um, hey, I hate to interrupt, but, of course, we have some super chats. Uh, super chat first by uh, John, our good friend and fellow uh, member of uh, our regular show panel, uh, also known as Das Wolfen. Das Wolfen, would you like to touch my monkey? Maybe. Um, John says, I am a fan of Josh's work even if he is a friend of Gary's. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave us a $5 uh, uh, super chat to say that. For you, sir, I say this. Well, whatever helps you sleep at night, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, next comment is from uh, Krampus Jeebus. That's the Jeebus previously known as Monkey Jeebus. And Monkey Jeebus says, can you tell Bruce Campbell, and this is to you, Josh, can you tell uh, Bruce Campbell that Gary goes by backdoor Gary now? <laughs> why, why, Gary? I don't want to go into it. It's so fucking <laughs> stupid. Please explain. But, uh, well, we have videos just for this, so uh, you, sir, uh, are going to get one of those videos right here. Open your back door, baby. Loosen your hinges, I'll show you my key. <laughs> Thank you for the $5 super check, Jeebus. Um, it's it's a long story. Uh, a Hispanic friend of mine has his own show, and he dropped in. He called me Backdoor Gary. And it got started from there. So now it's a big thing. <laughs> it's just dumb. Um, but you I and also Jimmy was... Morrison were pals, huh? That's right, Jimmy Morrison. And uh, also, uh, two of my favorite military uh, uh, videos for this show. Number one, here's your free cup of coffee from a lady in Rhode Island. What? There you go. And the next one. You got any good stories I could tell them about how cool Nam is? You know, there's lots of things you expect in war. Carnage. The sleepless nights, but what they don't prepare you for is the incessant use of fortunate sun. <laughs> <laughs> they sure do like to put that song in near me, and I tell you, um, I want to thank you guys for your super chats, and uh, and now we'll return to our regular broadcasting for at least another 20 minutes. Uh, so you've got this script with Dan Daly, and you go into really a lot of interesting little tidbits. And one of my favorites you put in there was that his use of yoga. Yeah. Uh, go mean? into well, that. What, specifically what, what, yeah. Cause you were going into, this was not a, uh, some just, you know, podunk guy. People like to think uh, warriors are, are dumb. He was a fascinating dude and he was interested in yoga. He was well read for a guy with no education. And right. what I did is I attributed this, and this is me as a writer, to the fact that I say he didn't sleep well. That that killing three or four or five hundred Chinese boxer rebe rebels uh, kind of kept him up. And giving him a lot of extra time at night to read. And so he's a particularly well-read, uneducated fellow. Yeah, no formal education, but uh, I consider some of the smartest people I know are the people who did it on their own. And right. I would put him right into that. Yeah. Um, so what was it with the yoga? Well, I don't know. I don't know what you're specifically referring to. Because you had him doing yoga at one point in there, and I thought that was interesting that you had Dan Daly doing yoga. Well, and I have him discussing all kinds of oddball crap because he's one of these people who just knows a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff. And anytime he meets like an officer who seems smart, he'll question like, have you read Nietzsche? And like, what? <laughs> <laughs> he said that, you know, this, and it's like, um, 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 uh, I don't know. And so he's a guy who's, always trying to find things out. And and part of this is, you know, I, I have to fill out the character and he's a guy who, you know, anyway, of, so uh, uh, he's, you know, there's many topics he's interested in. Um, yeah. Now of the script, um, every, every writer I know has a favorite moment. What was your favorite moment in your screenplay for Bella Wood, the Battle of Bella Wood? When, okay. Yeah. Okay, suppose you had seen Acts 1 and 2. No. Um, the, uh, uh, how do I even explain this? Of the Americans get there. It's the town is called Chateau Theory. And there is a railroad crossing there over the river. And they get to Chateau Thierry and suddenly 40,000 Germans are coming. And they 
skedaddle back as fast as they can over this railroad crossing back to the other side of the river where, where they're going to defend themselves. They're making their stand on the opposite side of the river. So, except a few guys get left behind because they were like scrounging around for food. And suddenly the whole town is occupied with thousands of Germans. And these guys have to make it back. The battle has not begun. Everyone's just getting into position. Thousands of machine guns. And every, the battle isn't going to begin till the next day. And these guys are on the wrong side of the river. And so they just have to run. As, their only plan is, let's run as fast as we can. <laughs> And they run across this railroad crossing, and, and suddenly the battle begins. They cause it because the Germans start to shoot at them, and the Americans start to shoot back at the Germans. And off you go, and these guys make it make it back. In the middle of, you know, they basically brought, this is going to happen anyway. But uh, they, so that's a good point. I like find when they come upon the Senegalese, I think is terrific. And as you go along through the 30 days in the battle and you keep time, it, you know, keeps going by and they're grungier and, you know, there's another yeah, so gas so attack good. and, you know, okay, let's just back up a moment between what I was trying to do, which was commonly done in war pictures that is no longer done in war pictures which is probably the last time was platoon of where you get to know everybody first so that when they get killed, it matters. Yeah. And one by one, they're all getting killed. So it was crucial that you know who all these guys are in this platoon. And in modern, you know, it's not that modern anymore, but it's a good example of Black Hawk Down. I don't know. God, damn, do I need these? Talk. Somebody say something. Hello. Oh, I do need them. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll get better headphones. I actually have better headphones with the wrong plug. <clears throat> so what was I saying? Um, oh, oh, shit. Boom. Platoon, huh? yeah, we're talking about platoon. How you got to know the characters yes, and Black Hawk Down. <clears throat> oh yeah, everybody right. has is in the same uniform, and that's a problem in a military movie. Everybody's in the same outfit, and if you go to or Black Hawk Down, where they're wearing you know black stuff all over their face too, I can't tell anyone apart. On top of which, and this is modern movies, they go right into the action. Well, they never give us that act one of which you get in Platoon. And if you didn't have it, it wouldn't be a great movie where you get to know everybody. You care about them and then you see them one by one. What deal with what happens. Yeah. You know, you got and and I haven't seen Platoon in a long time, but yeah, I'm telling you, you, know, you got the Kevin Dillon bunny character. That guy scares me, man. You know, he's the one with the shotgun. And you know, you've got McGinnis character, you know, who did the thing I would fantasize about as a kid, like when I was seven or eight, of if the big shit storm comes, I'm hiding under dead bodies. And that's what the John McGinnis character does. He just pulls dead bodies over himself. And then afterwards, motherfucker, he comes out. And so you get to see how each character deals with this problem called war and if you don't go to that trouble it doesn't matter the humanity is key to this yeah to the story and yet's what you were doing with bella wood that's what i'm saying and that is what's not done in in war pictures you know first of all you can't make a war picture that's about courage and being valiant and glory. You can't do that. If you make a war picture now, it must be an anti-war picture. 
the fact that there is an entire side to war that of heroes and courage, uh, you can't show that. That's not, you know, it's viral masculinity. Yeah, and we talked about that earlier this morning, that um, uh, every warrior is anti-war. And um, a well-done war film is in itself, if it's done right, anti-war because it's graphic and horrifying and the way i <clears throat> showed that because i'm not making a pro-war film i'm just trying to show what these guys are going through and when they are told to get back into the trucks with the vietnamese drivers at the end come, they get back into the truck and three quarters of them are not there anymore because three quarters of them got killed. And that's where you realize just how many of this platoon didn't make it. Yeah. And throughout the entire battle, uh, you're losing characters you know in almost every scene. And anyway, I think that's how you should make a war picture, in my opinion. I mean, that kind of... Uh, a single battle kind of thing. Well, yeah, and, a lot and, of that, in in my opinion, actually emanates all the way from the Napoleonic Wars in the very beginning of the 19th century, the tactics that were used. At the beginning of the Civil War, we used the same tactics. Yeah. The problem was the weaponry had changed drastically. During Napoleon's time, we didn't have rifled rifles or rifled muskets. They were all smooth for, which meant that you'd have to get up to 30 or 50 yards to have any hope of hitting anything. Well, the Civil War, you could hit somebody damn near at a mile if you had a good man with a good rifle. Now think about that. In a period of just a skosh over 50 years, we yes. have gone from smooth board to rifle. Now, in World War I, once again, they started using the same Napoleonic tactics. But by then, everybody had manually operated bolt-action rifles and fully automatic machine guns. And the Germans, well, you know what the nickname was for the German Maxim. The devil's paintbrush. Mm. Everything was red from one end to the other. So, yeah, yeah. The generals just continually try to fight the last war, not the one that's happening right now. Yeah. And that's my story. I'm fucking sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, with, with Dan Daly, you know, again, uh, this is an iconic character, and I don't think enough people know who he is. Um, there isn't even a book. There's has never been a book written about him. Yeah, if you're not in the Marine Corps, odds are you don't know who he is. No. Um, you know, because he's just not somebody that people talk about. Chesty Puller is another one. You hear the name Chesty Puller, and the first thing that popped in my mind was some uh, chick with big boobs. I just like, like, what the fuck is Chesty Puller? And the Marine shot me a dirty look when I said it. And I'm like, okay. But at least, <laughs> at least, but at least, you. But at least there are books about him. Yes, there are. And, and you uh, know, I've got a couple and I've read them. But there is no book about Dan Daly. In I think my, somebody needs to write one. I just did, uh, 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 there's not enough information information available there's no information and i did i researched so hard that i finally came across his grandson who was a, a fireman in new york city and he contacted me because i had the the uh, screenplay posted on my website and he said he had all of dan daly's letters and would and Dan Daly had put in his will that he did not want them published. 
And this guy wouldn't let them be published. And I said, don't let them be published. You're right. Send them to the United States Mil uh, Marine Corps historical. You, you can't let these things go. Send them to the Marine Corps. It's part of U.S. history. Yep. And he went, well, I don't think I can do that. I went, ah, uh -huh. you can't throw them out. Set the Marine Corps, if you send it to them and say, don't let anyone but scholars read them, they'll do that. You know, they have their own historical arm, the Marine Corps. Of course they do. And anyway, I, I never so There is almost no information. The most information I could find on Dan Daly was in an old Leatherneck magazine from the 60s. I found it. And it was a issue dedicated to him and that was the most information that in no books i could there's a reference to him he's referred to here and there but there's very it's, little information it's shocking because he is so revered within the marine corps that so little is known about him you yeah. know what harry truman said about the marine corps right no. no, what did he say? Well, he was Army, World War I. Yes, Army. right. Artillery okay. captain. Yeah. <clears throat> he said the Marine Corps has the greatest propaganda service since Joe Stalin. <laughs> oh. Harry Truman. Oh, yeah. Oh, Harry was Army. You know, our, that the Army isn't going to show any respect for the Marine Corps. <laughs> oh, we do though. We do. We love them. Uh, I love the Marines. And, and we talked about it this morning, Josh, is that um, the Marines were always the insertion force. They were the ones who yes. were there to wedge in, but that changed in World War II because they were only going to fight in the Pacific. So we needed something like that. And that's why the Rangers were created. Yeah. And right. it's a fascinating process of, how things changed in the military because of World War II and the jobs that each branch did. And it changed. It evolved. Um, but Dan Daly is somebody, because um, I've heard more about Chesley Puller than any, uh, than any famous Marine. There's another famous Marine that I do like, and for some reason his name escapes me. He was a big actor from uh, the late 40s all the way through the 60s in Westerns. Oh, big, oh, ugly oh, dude. Uh, 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 uh. Highly decorated. No, uh, uh, oh, for goodness sake. Uh, um, yes, I, well, you just, here, I'll tell, um, oh, for goodness sake. Anyway, continue on. I, 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 I think I he was on High Chaparral or one of those shows. And yes, he I always, was. when I was a kid, I thought he was, he looks like Jack Kirby's Hulk in the face. And I wondered if he was, as a kid, I thought, oh, he's actually the Hulk. But I also wondered if maybe he was the inspiration for the Hulk because he looked too much like him. Well, a much more recent Marine, and unfortunately a lot of people today probably will not recognize him, but he did one hell of a job in Vietnam, Carlos Hathcock. I do well, not. Do you know, know that who name. that is? No, I don't. Hmm? He was the Marine Corps' most successful military sniper. He had 93 confirmed kills and probably three to four times that that were not confirmed. Carlos Hathcock. He went out, stalked, and brought down a North Vietnamese general officer. He's the one with the big price tag on his head, right? White feather. Right, white feather. Yeah. Neville they, they Brand. Neville. That's who it is, Neville Brand. Neville Brand. Um, great. I love that guy. What a great yeah, actor. Yeah, that voice. Neville Brand had that great voice. Gravelly voice. And uh, ended up reading like he was almost as highly decorated as Audie Murphy. Yeah. Well, I remember seeing uh, Audie Murphy's movie to Helen back as a kid and yeah. thinking, which was made in 55. So it's 10 years after the war ended. And I'm watching it thinking, this guy's too young for this part. And he, really was young guy. Guy. he looked so damn young. It was ridiculous. And it was already 10 years later. Of, But uh, here's a little, 
This is my kind of minutia. Um, uh, to Hell and Back, which was really a B movie. It wasn't an A-list universal picture. Was the highest grossing picture for Universal for 20 years from 1955 until 1975 when it got beaten by Jaws. Huh. That's amazing. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pull up this image here real quick because Neville Brand uh had that face, and here it is. I'm gonna share it real quick. Uh share screen, share screen. There it is. Look at this guy. Yeah. He was a grizzled, ugly dude, but God, I loved watching Oh, he's, but he's got charisma. He's got, you know, he, yeah. look at that face. Look at him here. Look at this. Just That's what a no, dude, man. And he worked a lot. He's in a lot of movies. Yeah, I think the last thing he did was that based on a true story of that guy in the was it Florida or Louisiana that was feeding teenagers to uh, alligators? <laughs> Horror film he did. And it's like, holy shit. I wake red. I'm like, it was a true story. Oh, my God. Hey, um, Gary, we, we need to yep, break. I'm looking and I see that. So we will be right back after these messages. Go for it, Chanel. Hi, guys. This is Gary from Pop Culture Minefield here on KGRA. And we're leaving for our first break. I hope we survive. Hey members, the new KGRA DB app is now available on iOS and Android devices. Gain on-demand access to any KGRA DB programming. Download any show directly to your mobile device to listen or watch on the go. Go to the App Store and search KGRA DB. most important question facing humanity. It's not just a donation. It's a warm blanket. It's a bottle of clean water. It's a roof and a bed. It's knowing someone cares. It's feeling safe. You said today that's better than yesterday. Every dollar you can spare helps so much more than you can imagine. Please donate now to help people affected by Hurricane Ian. Your support is urgently needed. You're listening to the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. We provide unparalleled coverage of trending news in the world of ufology, cryptozoology, and paranormal phenomenon. Whether you're watching our video live stream or listening to one of our audio programs, you are getting the best from world-renowned researchers and hosts guiding you through topics the mainstream won't touch. Miss one of your favorite programs? No problem. Head over to the members area at KGRADB.com for access to our massive library of award-winning content. Make contact, stay connected, only at KGRADB.com. Oh, wow, we survived. Welcome back from the commercial break. Now for some more pop culture minefield on KGRA. And hello, good evening, and welcome to the middle of the film. <laughs> halfway hey. through the show. <laughs> I will We're halfway through. through the show? Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to stick let... around for the whole time if you got shit to do. Um, I do. <laughs> yeah, I know. You got to deal with that tire. But um, 
uh, before you go, I'll tell you. Uh, I mean, if any, it's not it won't be today. But if you want to talk, I mean, uh, you know, as I wrote to you to earlier, I mean, I'm happily, uh, I would happily discuss, you know, World War II, or, but I, I would really love to discuss the Barbary Wars. And decay. well, that is actually something I would like to talk about too, because um, uh, you know, our warfare against it was our first battle outside the U S where we took the fight to the enemy and which happened people, to be Islamic, basically jihadists. Yeah. Who felt that they had, well, the, what, 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 I don't even jihadist. What does that mean? Uh, well, jihad is just a simple word in, in Islam. I'm meaning, saying, but these people ran these countries. They were jihadists. That, that was their countries. Well, they also believe that they due to, uh, uh, their Islamic belief, they believe that they had the right to do what they were doing. Uh, and they used their, their belief system to do what they were doing. Okay. The Barbary well, pirates. What, and, honestly, they just felt like if you came through the Straits of Gibraltar, you owed the money. That's it. <laughs> and here's the other thing is the British kind of supported them because um, they thought it was okay. They were okay It with was that. cheaper to pay them than to fight them. Yeah. And yeah. of course, you know, but there is a story there I'd like to go into with you because um, it is a fascinating what they right. did that that small detachment of Marines what they did. But that we'll save that for another show, Josh. Okay. And mercenaries, Mer that's it, paid mercenaries. Um, let's talk about that th next time. Let's uh, wrap this show up for you because I know you got some other things you want to do uh, or need to do. And yes. um, with Bella Wood, um. Let's say we pushed to do that. And I mean, I want to do it as a graphic novel. I absolutely do. Even if I don't draw it, if I am the senior guy making sure it's done correctly, um, I want to make sure that that story is told someday. But have you ever thought of going the route that some of these filmmakers have done of doing um, crowdfunding campaigns? It doesn't work. Some of them do. They actually, they actually kick them uh, It doesn't work. Because I've I've funded four books that way, and yeah, we're uh, talking about a twenty million dollar twenty movie. million uh, dollar film. I'm telling you, I think it could work. I'm not saying yeah, it would I, work. I, I would I would could. rather just sit here with a forty five and shoot my toes off. <laughs> well, if you do that, Josh, would you let me watch? <laughs> would you let me watch? <laughs> wait, well, wait, I'll, wait, I'll wait, wait, shoot wait. a video of it. You know, exactly. But, uh, yeah, put it on Patreon. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, no thanks. I'm 64 <laughs> years old. I don't care about film finance anymore. You're a kid. You're yeah, a kid. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. You got 20 million dollars. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll pull it right out of my How front. everybody is like 20 million. That's nothing. <laughs> really? Oh my but god. I'll take oh my god. 21 oh million. Well, so, in in the immortal words, uh, before you go, um, of uh, Robert Shaw, I will play this for you. Farewell and adieu to you fair Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you ladies of Spain. <laughs> and once again, he was shit-faced. He was always shit-faced. Oh, oh, yep. And the scene, the dialogue right before it to leave on this is, uh, he goes, he goes, what the hell is that? He points at the cage, and uh, Dreyfus goes, "It's an anti-shark." And he goes, "What are you, some kind of half-ass astronaut?" And he goes, <laughs> "What's that?" He goes, uh, "It's an anti-shark cage." He goes, "You go in the cage. Cage goes in the water. In the water. Sharks Wait. in the water. Our shark. Farewell and adieu to you, fair Spanish, Spanish lady. ladies. <laughs> Farewell to you. Anyway." That All right, thank you, you, thank on, thank you very much. I had a pleasure. It's good seeing you, my friend. I'll talk to you later. We'll see you Friday. So um, good luck with the tire. Thank you. All right. See you later, man. That was great. I'll tell you, Robert Shaw, there was no better Bond villain ever than he on From Russia With Love. Absolutely. I agree with you. In fact, I consider that film to be the best adapted and the single best James Bond film 
from that era, and it is the second best James Bond film of all time. From Russia and, with Love, I that was the first Bond film I ever saw, and oh my God, I I was just taken away by that. And Robert Shaw scared the bejesus out of me. He was dangerous. And that's the way you want your villains. You don't want them silly. You want them dangerous. Um, and the 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 villains in, don't get me wrong, Goldfinger, I didn't consider, I mean, the freaking hat, throwing a hat. Really, man, who throws a hat? <laughs> Austin <laughs> Powers. Um, or a shoe. He's a shoe. Um, look, uh, Bond's best villain, I think, is by far Robert Child's character. Um, because he was dangerous, he was killing people throughout the movie. Movie opens with him killing somebody, you yeah. know, thinking it's Sean Connery, but it's actually a guy wearing yeah. a mask. Um, what a great film from Russia with Love, one of my favorite Bond films. I'm glad I got to do that with uh Toxic Tuesday. We actually covered that film. I missed the last two episodes, but next week, I think, is it's uh, what is next week's uh, guys? I forget, is it Goldfinger? Uh, we can't be friends with Goldfinger is the best Bond film ever. You know, if if that were true, John, I would have you sitting in the passenger seat in my car and I'd push a button. That's all I'm going to say to you, John. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so uh, odd job. Yeah, odd job. What a weird character. Uh, don't get me wrong. That was a cool film. I love Goldfinger. There's some great moments in like, uh, well, I suppose you expect me to talk. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Um, <laughs> just some great lines in that film. But again, you know, it took years before we got another good Bond film that was as good as uh, From Russia With Love. And that next film was Casino Royale. And I well, really Well, I kind of film. liked to You Only Live Twice. I did. I liked You Only Live Twice. No, that's twice. a great film. So was, uh, there are other two more with him. Uh, Spy Who Loved Me and For Your Eyes Only. Those three were the best Roger Moore films. And the single best uh, Sean Connery was from Rush With Love. Um, I like both of the Timothy Dalton films because he was trying to take it back to the book. He was trying to get it back to the book. He was an actual, he's the only actor to play Bond who was actually a fan of Ian Fleming and read all the books is Timothy Dalton. Pierce Brosnan was born to play the character but i felt that his films were sub par to even what was written for timothy dalton um the best bond film with pierce brosnan was actually just the opening beginning scene of him from uh die another day the whole north korea thing that was amazing yeah. the rest of the film was crap that by itself was a movie that i i freaking with sean loved. bean who yeah. died oh, Sean once again. Golden Eye. Yeah, Golden Eye died once again. He that's a great knife fight, though, in Golden Eye between those two. That fight up inside the, the dish, uh the, the top part of the, the spire of the dish. Uh that's yeah. a good fight scene. Um, and then I'm not a big fan of Daniel Craig past um the first film, and I kind of like the second film. I don't care what anybody says, because it is nothing more than the final act of casino royale the entire movie um uh Sol solace whatever it's called well i gotta i gotta give daniel craig credit because he brought the dark intensity of bond and the thugness of that character is yes. brutal side of him yes and uh oh i wanted to share this also while we have a chance uh share screen this is Audie murphy man he looks like a kid he was a kid. I know. Look at all those decorations. This guy was in the thick of it. And once again, he shot human beings with a 50 caliber bullet that was not supposed to be used against human beings at the time. It was well, against they the could, they could use 500 pound bombs and incinerate civilians, but not use a not 50, 50 cal. Uh -huh. But nobody called him on it because <laughs> that was heroic as hell. He went out there, got burned in the process shot all those guys and protected his men. Well, look, it's real simple. After Malmendy, when the SS troops 
executed close to 100 surrendered American troops, okay, during the Battle of the Bulge. Executed them. Didn't take them prisoner. Took them prisoner and then shot them, okay? Well, guess what? After that point, not too many SS were taken prisoner by American troops any longer. As a matter of fact, neither did the Canadians, who were not big fans of the SS, after what they did to their POWs. And you know what? Not too many people talked about that. And after Dachau was liberated, which incidentally my old man was there, what happened? They took a lot of those SS guards out and shot them for retribution of what they did to those prisoners. And a few tried to make a big deal out of it. But you know what? William Sherman said it best, war is hell. Uh, Tecumseh Sherman, uh, it just, you know, man, we just don't have guys like him anymore serving in the military. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, it's like uh, one of the worst things that happened in the Civil War was uh, there were two events, uh, one dealing with the prisoner camp and the other one was the burning of Atlanta. But you talking Sherman about said, Andersonville? Yeah, Andersonville. What a fucking travesty. Um, but when he burned Atlanta, he didn't have to. And he turned around his response to why, as he says, sometimes in order to put the terror that's required in your enemy, you have to do worse than them. And you have to be willing to if you want to win. And you just don't have anybody like that anymore that's got the well, the, you know, it's like the guts, the it's balls. It's like our most recent war. They went after those, uh, were they Marines or were they Army that took a leak on those dead jihadist bodies? I forget now whether they were Marines or Army. And they went after them to prosecute them for it, for God's sake. Yeah. Well, you know what? You can't do much worse. Then fill somebody up with five, five, six, okay, and watch them bleed out, and then take a leak on them. That's that's bad. Come on. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, it sounds to me like they were shitting on me in the chat. So, uh, do, do you know what he's what Anima was talking about there, uh, Martin? Not really. So, yeah, this there's been a lot of mention to backdoors and everything, but. Yeah, I, I was going to play a video, so I've got it already lined up. Here you go. For all those backdoor uh, breaches. Well. Mike, wouldn't you know that back door would trigger a trap door? Yeah, and look where we landed. Right in the yeah. middle of the show. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people may think I'm I'm somewhat of a, a troglodyte the way I'm talking here. but uh, I don't. Until, well, I, I know you don't, but until you've had somebody go out of their way to blow your head off and watch some of your best friends bleeding all over the landscape, you're not going to get it. And that's how why it's so hard to talk to a civilian. And I've had a lot of civilians over the years come up to me. Hey, what can you tell me about Vietnam? Nothing that you would grok. Uh, not yeah. a damn thing. It's true, you know, and that I told may you. That sound a little shitty, but that's how it is. Well, I told you I had that incident back in the 90s when I um, I made the mistake of feeling too comfortable with people, civilians that never served. And I said something, I talked about something, and they were terrified of me. They thought I was going to lose my mind and kill everybody in the office. And I'm like, what? Just because I talked about that thing? You know, and I just I stopped talking about some things in front of people because they don't understand. And you know, it it, it is what it is. You know, and I, that's a philosophy I live by. That there's going to be those who understand us, and there's going to be those of us that don't get us. And uh, I I find the majority of civilians I'm very cautious with. Uh, I surround myself with veterans because I understand them, and they understand me better than anybody. Now, there are civilians who have great passion and love for those who serve. They get it. Oh, my God, Gap. <laughs> All right. This is the closest thing I'm going to do to that one now. 
uh, is it, it has the word ass in it. So here you go. Now this is the plan. Get your ass to Mars. There you go. <laughs> um, and for all of you that are, are getting into the back door now, here you go. There you go. <laughs> um, but the fact is, you know, veterans, you know, um, it's like that line from Blade Runner with Rutger Hauer at the end when he's talking to Deckard. And he's, it's, it really is. This, this really makes sense for veterans. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. And he used the phrase that I use when I'm talking to civilians, you people. I've seen things that you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watch sea beams, sea beams glitter in, at Tannhauser's Gate. You know, that is the lines of a veteran. And that's why I've always liked that line so much is nothing touches on the, the feeling of a veteran more than, than that scene. Because his character is a combat veteran. Roy Batty in Blade Runner is a combat veteran. Yeah. And what he was talking about was the warfare. They were he created to fight. Yep. That's all he was made for was fighting. Uh, yeah, don't even try to trigger me, Bill. It's not going to fucking work. Um, fuck you, Bill. God damn it. Now, I never did figure out who they were fighting, for God's sake. Well, uh, another colonies, these, another human. Yeah, other colonies that... Uh, what, what Philip K. Dick talked about in a lot of his books is that once you colonize the planet, you were non, no longer part of Earth. This was your home. This was your nation. This was your world. And Mars, in one of his books, humans on Mars go to war with Earth. And it's really one of my favorite stories that he wrote. Uh, that is yet to be adapted. And I would love to see it. Because the main character is like um, that character that uh, Jim Carrey played that he's the whole world was created for him. He lives in a world that was created for him, and it's made to look like 1959 um, America. Every year, it never changes. Eisenhower is still president. Uh, Marilyn Monroe is still alive, you know, and all this shit. But he notices, you know, all these little things get his attention. And ask that question. Philip K. Dick, the most common themes are, is, is my memories my own? Am I who I think I am? Is this world what I think it is? You know, because he suffered from mental illness as well as other dude, problems. Dude, we're in the Matrix, dude. We're in I the mean, Matrix. That is. Uh, yeah, fuck you, Lord Thoth. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. You guys are really taking shots at me today trying to trigger me. Blade Runner. That's a quaint little film. <laughs> yeah, the Truman Show. Um, I thought that there was something very Philip K. Dickian about the Truman Show. Because, it, it, you know... This was a world created for him. And, and of course, that's because there was this one book. It's not Rubik. I can't remember the name of the book. I have it somewhere. I'll have to find it where that guy is being made. And what in reality is happening is there is a war between Earth and Mars. Humans on Mars have gone to war with Earth and they keep firing rockets. And in order to figure out where the rockets are, um, these numbers are being fed into a puzzle. And the only person that can solve that puzzle is this physicist who is now thinks he's just the guy that lives with his sister and he solves a puzzle for money. And the puzzle you, is actually, do you realize that. how that trope has been used in so many science fiction shows and programs? Oh, sure. The expanse. Yeah. Okay. The expanse is one. Babylon yeah. five is one. Yeah. I mean, there've been a ton of them where Mars is colonized declares its independence, and before you know it, total got recall. a planetary war. Total recall. Total recall. No, Another just, Philip K. Dick story. Total recall. They they weren't at that point yet. But um, we're, they're approaching fast. Yep. So it's just uh, really good. I like science fiction. I like good science fiction. I like militarily themed science fiction. It's, it's my favorite kind of sci-fi is military uh, thriller, action thrillers. Um. Because so much of science fiction is going, you know, going to be handled in it by people. I mean, even 2001 Space Odyssey, those guys were military, the astronauts. You know, it's it's almost always going to involve people in the military. 
whatever. Well, goes speaking on of there. Heinlein, which we have in speaking for a while, of Heinlein, <laughs> two books of his are at the pinnacle for me. Of course, the first one, Starship. the actual Starship Troopers, right? The real book, and one I told you about. You said you hadn't read, called The Glory Road. Yep. That is an excellent book. And I bought it on um, Amazon. Uh, I got the, what do you call it? The the digital copy. I just, I got to find time. And what I do is, the same thing I do with your stuff, is I put a voice to it and I let it read to me in my headset. So, because I hardly ever have time for reading anymore, much less writing and drawing. But uh, this show is, um, a lot of my energy is going into doing this show because in January, uh, this program, all of our programs on on uh, Pop Culture Minefield will be coming to KGRA. I'm very excited about it. Um, I'm also terrified. <laughs> like, uh, I have that, what hey, do they Gary, call that? Gary, Imposter hey, Gary, syndrome. Gary, yeah. Gary, Gary. We're on KGRA right now. Right now. Um, and I have that, because uh, I just talked to a friend of mine who has that imposter syndrome. Um, I always fear that people are going to find out I'm just a hack. <laughs> I wing it. I mean, everybody knows I wing it. Um, I wing everything. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go, but you know what? Let's do it. Because <laughs> it's like my dad raised me. Be afraid of nothing. Just go ahead and do it. What's the worst going to happen? You're going to fail, you know? Uh, but then again, you know. All you got to do is shuffle to the door. Grab your strap and take one step out. That's it. Uh, what What is that singer's sister that couldn't sing? She faked the vocals on Saturday Night Live. She shuffled off the stage. <laughs> That's what that popped into my head. Shuffle off. Oh, I got caught. <laughs> Dance off. <laughs> but uh, I like doing this show. I like talking about the stuff we talk about. Um, I like hanging out with veterans. Uh, one of my favorite things to do when I drank beer was to go down to the VFW or the um, uh, American Legion. It just, has, I mean, 25 cent beers, man. Yeah. I love that. Um, of course, it's always Budweiser, Miller, or Michelob, or uh, P uh, Pap Blue Ribbon. That's oh, PBR is no the only way best. to go, dude. PBR, that's it. PBR. Uh, look, if I'm going to drink piss water, I, I prefer Coors. <laughs> but I do like I love Budweiser and Pabst is really a good piss water beer. Um when I drink, it's in the fridge right now. Guinness. It's what I if I'm gonna break down and have a beer, I actually have a stout. I like that. Well, I'm gonna it's, do a Guinness, I gotta do a black and tan. Okay, there's no yeah. other way to do it. But don't order that in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> like Ricky Checker. I gotta get him on this show, Ricky. I love yeah. Ricky. He's like, he was in the army there serving in Northern Ireland and went into a pub and ordered an Irish pub and ordered a black and tan. They gave it to him, but then they said, no charge, but finish it and go. Don't, don't come back. And we advise you to never order that again in Ireland. And then he went and found out because he told his commanding officer and he goes, he's like, lad, why would you do that? Why? <laughs> Uh, Budweiser is a um, yeah, it's a beer. It's a beer. It's just not a very kind strong kind of piss water. beer. American beers it. tend to be piss water beers. I mean, they just tend to be. Uh, two to five percent alcohol is just not much to me. I like it, but now Guinness originally in Ireland was eleven percent alcohol, but now it's not. They've dropped it down to the uh, American standard. So now all Guinness is like right around, I think, 5%, 5.5%, some shit like that, which is still better than most American beers, which is 2.5. But, um, you know, I like I like beer. I like the taste of it. And I don't drink much anymore. But when I go out with my friends, I love it when they have a non-alcohol beer. I really do. I will drink the shit out of it because I love the taste of beer. People are like, why Pussy. do you like it? I'm like, fuck, I love the taste of beer. I just, I can't drink anymore. I just won't drink anymore. Because I, I've had my, my drunks. <laughs> my drunks. I got this fucking tattoo because I was fucking hammered out of my gourd. Um, and I've always told people, man, I don't drink because when I get drunk, you can talk me into just about anything. 
And I have <laughs> I have too many gay friends that I just won't drink around. <laughs> Will not drink around my gay friends because I never know what they're going to try to talk me into. Guinness is four. Okay, so it's 4.2. It's 4.2, not comma. What are you, from Croatia? <laughs> that annoys me in Europe that they switch it. The commas uh, take the place of the decimal, and the decimal no. isn't treated as a comma. It's weird. No, you switch it up. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody clip that, please. <laughs> As I used to say to one of my uh, uh, Mexican friends in the army, K. Okay? What? K. Okay? What? Okay. <laughs> I used to do that to, to Lopez, man, all the time. I, I would say, he would say something, I go, K. Okay? And he wasn't sure if I was saying okay or if I was saying what in Spanish. It annoyed him because whatever <laughs> one he finally figured it was, I would go the opposite way with him just to fuck with him. Uh, which means, yep. <laughs> man, I haven't had eggnog in a while. Don, Don loves his eggnog, man. Loves his eggnog. I make it. I make it. My problem Matter is. Matter of fact, it's homogenized now, and it, it just. I had yesterday. I I finished up my last bit of homemade nog, and I I used Kessel whiskey. Okay, mm -hmm. Kessel, very smooth whiskey, one of the smoothest you'll ever have, and uh, boy does it go good. Pinch of nutmeg on the top. Oh wow. Interesting. And uh, tis the season. I, all I have to say is um, when you go to the bathroom, do you call it the Kessel Run? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Some people don't, John. Um, I liked it the way my mom and dad made it when I was a kid. They would make it themselves with real eggs. Uh, the stuff they make today doesn't taste the same, and that's because it's homogenized. It's uh, been filtered. And so uh, he loves homo homogenized. Jeebus, Jeebus really going crazy today, boy. Yeah, Jeebus. Look, man. Jeebus is already in La La Land. <laughs> it's just he shares it with us. And if you listen to him for too long, he'll pull you into it. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's true. I like that. That's one of the things I always liked about um, the way my parents made the eggnog is it tasted like the batter for um, French toast because they would put nutmeg and cinnamon and uh, it was just, oh, it was sweet. Oh my God, it was so good. Oh, my, my sister-in-law, she adds uh, not, uh, men's nuts to the, to the eggnog. Men's nuts? Yeah. <laughs> what in the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> oh the my kind of nut that squirrels eat. Jew making so fun, right, oh Martin? Jew so making awful. fun? No. Oh. oh my god, that's so funny. That is so funny. Um, but eggnog is really good. I like eggnog. Um, I haven't had it in a long time, and I think I'd like to have some. I think Scott's and Don like eggnog too, so I'd probably get some eggnog from them. Um, but uh, I don't know. I would like to get some traditional, but they always want raw eggs, man. Man, I, I when I was like a, an athlete as a kid, I would down raw eggs all the time. Never got sick. Oh, when I first came back from the Army, red beer was the only way to go. Red beer with a raw egg in it, a raw egg and a splash of Worcestershire. Yep. There was a drink. When we were out in the woods and um, so often we'd go out camping or hunting and money was tight, we'd buy just the cheapest beer, usually Milwaukee's Best. And when you drink Milwaukee's Best, you have to drink it as a red beer. And you put the tomato juice in there. You or, or V8, either one. I like V8. 
or uh, clamato. The, now I've never tried that. I'm not. I've never tried it because it's got. It says it's got clams in it, and that grosses me out. But I do like any of the red juices uh, put into the beer with Tabasco sauce um, and uh, or Worcestershire too. It tastes good with that and pepper, pepper the shit out of it. And we, I remember getting hammered one night camping out, and we we're supposed to go hunting the next morning. Nobody fucking woke up. <laughs> We didn't wake up until like one o'clock in the afternoon. We got so hammered the night before on red beer, man. And if you've never heard of red beer, it's a really common way to, to make a, a shitty piss water beer taste good is you add uh, tomato juice, Clamato or um, V8 to it. Uh, and you add uh, uh, Tabasco sauce or even Worcester to it. And I, and pepper, an egg. I like put an pepper. egg in there, put an egg. I've never done it with the egg and that's a good idea. I'd like to try that. Um, but I got to tell you, man, it's a great way of, of drinking piss beer. It, it really is. Um, tastes the same going in as it does going out. That's all I got to say. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, and you know what, uh, one thing I liked, and this is something that really goes back to harkens back to like, uh, guys, your age and my age that grew up with men that grew up during the war, whether it was uh, world war two or, or Korea. And um, it was really commonplace for dads to let their kids sip their beers. Yeah. And I wouldn't let me drink it. He would let me sip it. I was allowed to have a sip, one or two tops. And I got a taste for beer as a kid because I'm like, that's just good. Same thing with coffee. Uh, I remember one morning um, uh, my mom, dad, and my older siblings took off to go fishing when we're up in Flagstaff, Arizona. And my sister and I stayed behind at the tent and they left the coffee. And we drank what was left of that coffee. And oh my God, I fell in love with coffee as a kid. Love that shit. Since I was a kid, man, stuff's good. But uh, Gap after, okay, chat, don't piss Gary's back. <laughs> Shut up, Gap. <laughs> Oh, my God. I do have to get that other video. I'll find it for us, Martin. My problem is trying to find all the videos. Uh, they're not all on my hard drive, so I'm going to have to go download them and edit them again, like the backdoor one. Um, <clears throat> but um, we've moved off from Bella Wood. Um, are, do you have any closing thoughts on Bella Wood, that first battle with the Marines and the Army? Because the Army was there. They just weren't fighting the first day. Yeah, I do. We won. <laughs> we i tell you what man the british and the french uh they pissed us off the country because after we won the war for them they're like you weren't here long enough you didn't bleed enough so you don't get a say in in the treaty so we were kept out of the the, the signing of the treaty of hey, you can blame the brits and the french for world war ii Okay, oh, I do. at the end of World War One, yep, they wanted to make the Germans bleed out their ears. Yep, and boy, did it come back and bite them on the ass. Sure as hell did. They created the perfect storm that that brought about Adolf Hitler. Yes, and, they did. Because uh, that country was dying. Uh, I remember in history class, uh, Mr. Waddell, who fought on D Day. He was in D Day. And uh, he had to deal with the hedgerows, if you know that story. Oh, yeah. And um, he um, said, you know, it took a barrel, a wheelbarrow full of uh, German marks to buy a single loaf of bread. Yep. And that's how destroyed the economy was in Germany. Because the yeah. French and the, and the uh, English forced Germany to have to pay every debt caused by world war one and by doing that they created that perfect storm for hitler to come into existence um so yeah and they would not let the united states be a part of that treaty and then when and hitler marched into the rhineland instead of manning up reaching in their pockets giving their balls a twitch and chasing the germans out they let them keep it and boy that was an open invitation from that point forward and Neville Chamberlain, what a, what a piece worthless of shit. piece yeah. of shit 
He was. Gave away Czechs, the Czechoslovakia. You know, Czechoslovakia was going to go to war with Germany. They were going to fight. And they were stabbed in the back by, uh, by Chamberlain. Stabbed in the back. They weren't going to give the Sudetenland to the Krauts. They said, no, no, no. And Chamberlain enabled it. Yep. And that was it then. And guess what? They got Reinhard Heydrich, the hangman. They got Heydrich in Czechoslovakia. And boy, did he make them bleed. It's it's pretty crazy, you know. And um, Neville Chamberlain, yeah, you, there's... I can't think of anything good about that guy. It's like, you know, my pop always said, you've got nothing nice to say. Don't say nothing at all. But you got Neville Chamberlain, and you all you've got is bad. You got World <laughs> the War The guy II was a closet Neville Nazi. Um, he, um, socialist. Uh, he um, absolutely, um, God, man, that guy. Um, and he was the one that kept saying, the Germans aren't being aggressive. Uh, you know, they'll sign a treaty and they'd sign a treaty. They'd sign a new treaty. And then immediately <laughs> they would just go and do whatever it was. They just agreed not to do like invade Poland. That what was that old joke uh, about World War II. What was Germany's favorite pastime invading Poland? Because <laughs> <laughs> they did Let's it. Let's not much. forget the Ruskies. They did it too. Oh man. Like anybody who tries to talk too nice about the Russians, I'm like going, Look, where did you think uh, Adolf got those uh, train ideas from? Hey, look, nobody today knows shit about the cat in the forest, okay? Here's the deal. Stalin was a realist and a pragmatist. He knew way ahead of the game what he was going to do. He wanted to make all of Eastern Europe, commie. And they figured sooner or later they were going to fight the Germans and they were going to beat the Germans and then he would have a free hand. So when they made the pact with Hitler, okay, the, war so the Germans and the communist Russians made a peace pact and when Hitler invaded Poland from the west, Stalin invaded it from the east, then Stalin rounded up every Polish officer, especially the aristocracy, took them back to Russia, and then about a year later, killed every last one of them. 15,000 officers were executed by pistol shots to the back of the head. Then, when the Krauts found these bodies, after they invaded Russia, Stalin tried to blame it on the Germans, which was, uh, well, pure Stalin. But uh, but yeah, yeah. How many people out there knew about the Katyn Forest Massacre? Very well, few. I did. They don't teach it. Yeah, they don't, they teach, don't it. teach it. Uh, they don't teach anything about what communists have done. Every single time they take over, uh, millions of people die. It's like that's just the common practice of communists. Millions and we got assholes it. here today that want to do that very thing, become yep. commie. Yep. Uh, and I tell people, I oh, I, I, absolutely. I tell people, um, socialism is nothing more than democratically elected communism. It's it's the doormat to outright the communism. The first social socialist leader is the is elected democratically. The rest mm -hmm. aren't. Yep. Hey, Gary, I almost got on a rant there. Wow. I better watch myself. <laughs> oh, don't, don't make me random socialist, please. Yeah, it's it's something I think that triggers all three of us. Um, you've had to deal with it because of, uh, you know, Venezuela, because that's yeah. where you're from. And you know what's going on there, yeah. you know, and... Nobody here wants to talk about it. The media doesn't want to talk about what's going on in Venezuela for real, that people's lives are over. We're hearing it now. and Nobody in the media is talking about uh, what's going on in China right now. Nobody wants to talk about it, uh, that they're in open revolt in China. Yep. The media doesn't want to cover that because 
they want that Chinese money. They want that money. Chinese China is our friend because they're giving us money. That's how these social. Uh, I got one of their almost Christmas trees. Yeah. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> and Vicky, I love that tree. <laughs> 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 um oh my god yeah if they do another puss in boots they need to get martine to do the voice oh please i need the money <laughs> <laughs> what we can do what we should do is do our own puss in boots and have you do the voice oh my really, god <laughs> really bad cg but it'll be funny no matter what I, I don't care about the cg i'm i'm afraid what you two are going to write <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it that way. <laughs> say what that way? The word you? You know. Oh you know. <laughs> um, uh, we love you, Martin. <laughs> and you know, I'm going to tell you how much uh, Don loves you. He, he worries that sometimes these jokes might be offending you. And I'm like, no, it is not offending Martin at all. He has a great sense of humor. Uh, you have one of the best sense of humors of any of us uh, sometimes. I think that you spot things even before I do. Um, they are doing a second Puss in Boots. It comes out next month. It's called Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Is that for real? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. I would, you know, my mind immediately goes to filth, which is Puss in Boots <laughs> would be a girl wearing boots completely naked. <laughs> that would be hot I'd want to watch that <laughs> she's really good with swordplay but nobody notices <laughs> uh, yeah you need to have a good sense of humor to stay friends with Gary it's true it's true and, and uh, I can only imagine your pain animal <laughs> God bless you <laughs> she is so funny um, I'm gonna we're going to on date night this week she's going to have to watch um, the the um, Outpost by Rod Lurie, a friend of mine. We got to get him back on the show because I know he's working on some new films. See what he's up to. Uh, um, I like the guy. I don't think he likes me because uh, he's he's left leaning. He loves the military and he supports soldiers, and that's all I care about. That's all I care about. Um, but um, it's so funny whenever he comes on the show, he'll go, he'll go, hey Keith. How are your kids? How's the family? And then not say a damn thing to me. And I'm like, I've got kids. I've got family. <laughs> <laughs> I love him anyway. He's a great filmmaker. Um, and I love his movies. But uh, yeah, I don't think he likes me personally. I don't think he hates me. I just think he, he tolerates me. Uh, well, you're one of those people, Gary, that being able to tolerate you with is a lot. Yes, it is. It's a lot. <laughs> well, I've said it time and time again. There's no half ass in it with me. You either like me or you don't like me. There's no like gray area. Uh, I think that people tolerate me. Uh, and I can always feel it. They think I can't notice it, but I do. I notice it, and it's it doesn't well, bother you're lucky. Me. You're lucky, asshole. I like you. <laughs> I like you too. <laughs> The first time you and I talked, I'm like, I fucking like this guy. I was on my walk. I, I was on one of my walks, walking around the block. And you and I had that about an hour long conversation talking about UFOs and shit. And um, I can still remember it like it was yesterday, just walking around that block. I love that neighborhood. Zoe was about seven years old there. It was so funny because uh, that was where I tell the story that when I moved out, I left the weekend that my ex and her kids were in, at Disney world down in Florida on vacation for three days. Uh, I packed up and left over the days that they were gone. And I was literally pulling out of the driveway in my last load of from U-Haul driving away. And they came pulling in like, what's going on? And that look on their faces. I, I saw them, but I didn't look directly at them. I made no eye contact. They just kept going. And I left the divorce papers taped to the door with everything <laughs> thumb marked for where she needed to sign. And uh, I'm professional, man. I'm a pro when it comes down to it. It's like no fuss, no muss. Uh, let's just end this. And and 
Uh, this, the funny part of it is the guy who does the announcement for the opening of our show, Mac, um, <laughs> left him at the house. And he was there when she came walking in, like, what the hell is going on? And poor <laughs> son of a bitch. He didn't know what to do. He's like a deer in headlights. Because uh. <laughs> I'm a dick. That's what I do. <laughs> I thought it'd be funny. It would make for a funny story later if I just left him there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Andy Morrow says, someone mentioned porn. I always mention porn. Porn's amazing. Uh, Anima is a saint putting up with Gary. Of course she is. She is Saint Donnie. And uh, notice again, I enunciate that, not Donnie, but and it's in between a ah and ah. And there's like this little middle area, and that's where I pronounce it. Uh, and I think it's a beautiful name. And uh, uh, we talked about it. if we ever get married, I might uh, hyphenate my name and take on her last name because it's such an awesome last name i won't say what it is no business oh yeah that and your man bun that'd be great i will never <laughs> fucking wear <a> don <laughs> um yeah this no. is gary he's got a hyphenated last name <laughs> and hyphenated. he wears a man bun well she'll tell you uh because it's a fact i hate my last name i hate it I've always hated it. I make that statement that uh, I am almost all Irish and uh, one German fucks his way into my family and I got stuck with his name. It's fucking crowd. <laughs> 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 so she said it's, you know, it's because I've established my name in publishing and, and with all the work I've done from film to, to um, doing these shows and doing um, uh, the comics and stuff that, I'm stuck with the name, but I could hyphenate it. <laughs> did did you did you have that bun the whole time? <laughs> Fuck you, Don. <laughs> oh. I I know what uh, why you like that. That's oh my god, name. Adam would jump to my defense. Fuck you, Don. No man bun allowed. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> what I love about Martin, you don't see him. Uh, he keeps a shaved head, man. And I always go, uh, what's up with that? Are you a skinhead? <laughs> Something you want to tell me? Oh, no. He no. likes to shave that head, man. Oh, do, do, do you want to know the story? Yeah, of course I do. Oh, well, it was in my university days when I was broke as fuck. So I, I haven't uh, cut my hair on, because I, I don't know. I, I prefer eating to <laughs> cut the hair. And I was uh, I was visiting a friend, and he he has a military background, and he has a clipper, and he he told me, man, I I, I could cut your hair. Uh, well, do it, and do it, do yeah. it now. So I, I <laughs> he he used the clipper, take out all my head. I look I look myself in the mirror, and I and I go, oh my fucking god. At least it will grow up again. And then when I'm on the street going to my house, the, the wind blows and the fresh air on the on my temples. I said, I will never let my hair grow again. This is so awesome. And then is that is a, the story, the simple explanation. Well, now I'm gonna tell you my story real quick. <clears throat> the pandemic starts, right? Early 2020. And my hair is getting long, and it makes me nuts. So especially when my sideburns start getting frilly and fuzzy, right? So I'm talking to Vic. We can't go out. Nothing is open. There are no barber shops. So I said, screw it. I'm going to get some electric clippers. So I go online get a hold of Amazon, buy some wall electric clippers, you know, W-A-H-L, the wall barber clippers, and get them home. And Vicky, God bless her little heart, does a halfway decent job. So I said, screw it. So for the last three years, that's what I've been getting my hair cut. Now, if I go to a barber, it's going to be anywhere from 25 to almost 50 bucks. Screw that. I can do it at home for free. And I do. 
And that's now, my gonna, story. Yeah, I'm and you're sticking, sticking with it. You fucking stick it. <laughs> Here you go. This is Zoe uh, from five, six years ago. Six years ago. Shaving my head. <laughs> She was so excited getting to do that to take all that long hair off of me. And it was a hot summer, man. I let her do it because I was burning up, man. And because my I, hair's I see a man bun in in, in shaping there, bud. <laughs> in shaping. Uh hold on. What did she say? If Vicky messes up, you can just put on a hat, Don. That's right. <laughs> when you get a messed up haircut, that's that's the best way to cover it up is ball cap. But um or you uh, can shave it. Or you can shave it. Shave it. <laughs> shove it. Juice said what? Juice said what? Shave it? Okay. Okay. Keep keep with that joke and, the, and YouTube will <laughs> kick us out. <laughs> They're going to label us anti-Semites. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, man. I, I got to tell you. Um, this whole use of anti-Semitism by the the left is killing me because they stand against uh, a sovereign Israel, which is the single most anti-Semitic thing you can do. So <clears throat> nobody from the left gets to dictate uh, how anybody feels on that. My family's Jewish. Um, my siblings, I'm the only Irish Roman Catholic out of a family of six Jews siblings. <laughs> and they all converted to uh, Catholicism or Christianity except for my brother Michael for years uh, until he had kids. And he, back in the eighties, he considered uh, being a rabbi. <clears throat> Bill, I, what the hell? I've been, I, I, I started like uh, can, Pussy. then Ricardo Montalban, <laughs> now uh, Diego Luna as Andor, and now Pussy Boots. What the oh, wait, fuck? No, 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 there's another. It's oh. called Let the Right One In, You Are the Dad. On that show. Ah, oh well, that I like. He's a good actor, that dude. Oh, that was. Uh, Are you watching the was... show? Are you watching? No, uh, no, but it's in my list. The movie, got the movie. Watch, no, the new TV series um, on HBO. Um, they took it, they expanded on it a little bit, and it's a father and his daughter. There's a story going on why the mother's not there. You eventually you learn it. There's another family. Because she was attacked on the same night as another kid by the same creature. Uh, or maybe somehow it's associated. Um, the father of that kid is a scientist who is working in the pharmaceutical industry and has been working on a cure. Um, for vampirism? For vampirism because it is apparently like a virus the way it works on the blood. And they're trying to figure it out, how it works. It's not demonic or horror vampires and although all the things that work in Bram Stoker's Dracula works in real life in this show uh, I'm enjoying the shit out of it and his dad is having to kill people for his daughter because you only have so many minutes until that blood is bad and they can't drink it uh, it has to be fresh and so um, he tries to find bad people Gary, people that we, are have, criminals we, have to, come back. we have to wrap so Give your thanks. We got one minute. Yeah. I can't do a minute. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. All right, man. Oh my god! Uh, great show today. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank. Uh, uh, let's see, Bill Barkley, Penny, Lord Thoth, Anima Confuse, the love of my life, Dragon Fe Ru Dragon Ruse, Gap After Dark, Zach's Parrothead, Krampus, Jeebus, Larry, Larry, Kingsport, Cow, uh, Slasher, Fred, Magitech, Mags, Das Wolfen, Edwin Trowell, Dork Knight. Uh, get through everybody's comments here. Kathy Pernisek, uh, Andy Morrow, Awesome One. Good to see you, Awesome One. Uh, and that's it, guys. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank Don. I want to thank Josh Becker for dropping in. Good friend. I love listening to him. He's one of my favorite human beings on this planet. Uh, Chanel, it's up to you. Take it away, man. I've said what I needed to say, and I'm fucking done.